Hey guys, it's the captain here. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Anderson's TV. My special guest today <laughs> is Jeff Schroeder, who you may recognize. He's been the guitar player in the Smashing Pumpkins for about the last 12 or 13 years. Yeah. Prior to that, very cool sort of uh, founder member of a band called the Lassie Foundation. Yes. All kinds <laughs> of cool, shoegazy <laughs> kind of guitar stuff. Yeah. And you are doing some festivals in Europe at the moment. And yeah. We've been here for about a month and we just did kind of the first leg of festivals and that ended last week and then we have a couple weeks off and then just kind of so kind of hanging out and bumming around various parts of the uk and then um then we start up in about a week in poland for another round of festivals so it's been fun and honestly it, this has been one of the the best festival runs we've ever done yeah. it, it's been we've Some played gigs yeah i've played a lot of shows with tool brilliant you know got to play the, i was telling you we played the other night with the cure and you know, I mean, if you would have told me as a kid, like, I mean, we walked off stage, our, our set, we were walking off to, you know, whatever, go off the back of the ramp, and there he just kind of came out of the, the dark, Robert Smith, you know, he did, and he watched the whole set, and so it's really cute to see him and Billy Hug as, like, two goth kids, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was really cool, and, you know, I mean, and... You know, and then like I said, you know, being able to watch Reeves from 10 feet away play in the band and, you know, the Cure sounded amazing and, you know, see, we got to play with Dream Theater the other week and, and wow, like, like just amazing players on stage and... Oh, it's superb. You know, what's so, always so interesting is, you know, doing festivals and now playing and having had the experience for the last decade or so is, you know, you'd always watch stuff as a kid mm. and you're like, wow, like, look at, you know whatever, Fi or any of these guys that were playing like Monsters of Rock and, you know, playing these crazy amazing songs and realizing now like, well, sometimes those conditions are really rough. It's either hot or cold. And the other day in Italy, it was blazing sun, like right at your face and Dream Theater was playing like right the height of the end. And John Petrucci was just up there like not missing a note, like making it look so easy. Oh, and what was also so amazing. cool is that you know, because, you know, like most bands, everybody's on in-ears, but his live cabinets were just right off. So it was like, you're watching him play in his cabinets were like just right here. And I got to hear the sound coming out of his amps. And it was just uh, it's, unbelievable. It's how it should be. Well, look, <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. Um, Jeff is going, we're going to do kind of two parts to this interview. We'll talk, talk to Jeff about, you know, uh, what his uh, inspirations were when he was learning to play the guitar. But we're also, stay tuned for a bit later in this video, we're going to wheel in kind of like uh, a little shoegazy kind of board that yeah. we've just put together in like two minutes. And we're going to go through kind of like the essential elements of just getting some cool tones. So you'll hear some mm. playing a bit later on, which should be good. Um, but yeah, let's talk about growing up uh, growing up in L.A., right? Yeah, yeah. I grew um, up in the suburbs, but yeah, be like 35, 40 minutes from the city. Yeah. yeah. And so at the time, uh, you know, which players were you drawn to? And, and what is it that you think sparked that uh, interest in kind of getting some maybe much more layered guitar tones than, mm. you know, maybe just like a traditional you know, rock guitar solo? Well, you know, I think for me, like when I started playing guitar was really at a kind of a zenith of a marriage of playing technique, the development of actually equipment to where, you know, you could kind of get these sounds. And so it was really a, now thinking back at it in retrospect, like, wow, what a time to start playing guitar, you know, because you would have, you know, whether it's Eddie Van Halen or Steve Vai or all yeah. these guys kind of pushing you know, what you could do on the guitar on that end to even players like The Edge and U2 pushing like kind of the Sonics on the other extreme and great songs and great albums and, yeah. you know, lots of money in the industry. And, you know, so it was really <laughs> just actually a fascinating time to play. I got into playing guitar first and foremost because, you know, I think my brother, I have a brother that's eight years older than me and he was really, in, you know, so he was born in 66. So he, you know, was a, your stereotypical massive Kiss fan right. in the you know mid to late seventies, <laughs> yep. and so I grew up with just Kiss posters. You know, you know, we shared a bedroom and just all around him. Yeah, even when I was in five years old for Halloween, I was already dressing Dresses up as post a, a, Ace Freely, Ace Freely for sure, because I knew I was like he's the coolest one, and so I just always wanted to play the guitar, and. Yeah, so I started, you know, I got a guitar when I was young, but really started taking it seriously about 86, 87. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I walked into a local music store and this crazy looking guy 
came up to me. He's like, hey, you know, like, you know, had some heavy metal shirt on and was like, oh, you like that? I was like, yeah, I yeah, like that. He's like, you know, what guitar players do you like? He's like, he's like, do you like Van Halen? I was like, yeah, I love Eddie Van Halen. And so he just picked up a guitar and started playing like Hot for Teaser, like note for note. And see somebody play that stuff right in yeah. front of your face, like from two feet away. You're like, wow. And eruption and played like Doc and stuff. And it's like, oh my God. And so I started taking lessons. And so that really was, um, you know, kind of set me off in the right direction where I was able to learn how to play the instrument, learn scales, chord relationships. But what was cool about it, because I think as of my background and my teacher, was, he was, he could play all that stuff, but he was like more of like a, he's like a weird 60s psychedelic freak, okay. you know, and so he would be like, hey, you know, besides docking, you should check out the Yardbirds, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and we, so I would learn like Yardbirds tunes or even Mott, bands like Mott the Hoople and, yeah. and stuff like that. So I got like a really well-rounded Kind of education in terms of of learning the guitar and kind of so I have like a pretty good general grasp of mm -hmm. of the instrument and kind of like I said the scale chord relationships and whatnot. Um, but then you know and 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 so all through like junior high and high school I was really into like guitar player guitar players yep. you know and um, even like as extreme as like I listen to. Like at one period in my life, I probably listened to nothing but shrapnel records, <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, Cacophony, Jason Becker, Vinnie Moore. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the yeah. whole, the, you know, Racer X. Yep. Uh, you know, I had the whole catalog. Oh, you know, man. and I still, you know, and to this day, I actually still love that stuff. And um, I listened to a, quite a lot of. We had Marty Friedman on about two months ago, yeah. and so I, I was kind of all that cacophony stuff that he did with sort of Jason Becker, and it's it's just yeah. it's like machine gun fire guitar Amazing. playing. Amazing, you know like, what I mean? Whoa. I actually went to, um, last year, I was able to go to Jason Becker's house and oh, hang wow. out with Jason, and he let me play all of, all those guitars, you know, that he's such a sweet human being, and, you know, beyond inspirational, yeah, you know sure. what I mean? And, um, yeah, so I was got really into that stuff, and then, you know, later... During high school, then, and I always like bands like U2 and mm -hmm. stuff, but, and, you know, and because I was so into players like Steve I and Satriani that I listened to stuff like Flexible mm -hmm. and not of this, or the more experimental work. Yeah. And were so, you going back towards a sort of a Zappa kind of? I didn't go as far back no. as to Zappa. I think Flexible and not yeah. of this, or is kind of where, mm -hmm. you know, but I did listen to things like Jeff Beck, Blow by right. Blow. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I was like the only kid in junior high listening to, <laughs> you know, Blow by Blow by Jeff Beck. And, you know, I remember meeting some keyboard player one time when I was like in early high school, and he was like, Oh, you play keyboards? I'm like, Yeah, I want to start like this fusion band like Jeff Beck. And he was like, Well, I'm into Depeche Mode. <laughs> it was like, I was like, Oh, he, like, it didn't really, it didn't really work out. But, um, yeah, but then kind of later in high school, so there's, you know, around 89, 90, I started learning more about, because I would, I would obsessively read guitar magazines, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and back then in the, in the States, they covered really cool stuff. So mm -hmm. you'd see the occasional, like, wow, oh, Bill Frizzell, who's this guy? You know, like, you know, I have like issues from like 1987, like Bill Frizzell, just like some weird you know, weird dude in the avant-garde jazz scene, you know, yeah. which later in my life, <clears throat> he's like one of my current favorite guitar okay. players, you know, but, but then you would see people like, oh, what, Jesus and Mary Chain, or My Bloody Valentine, or, or even, you know, I think even, you know, by 86, 80, like Sonic Youth was on the cover right. of Guitar Player magazine, and so I got, I, I started learning about that and, and looking for those records, and Luckily, where I grew up in Southern California, it's, it's, it's like in Orange County and stuff, there was like, you didn't, I didn't have to go up to LA to go find cool records. There was yeah. like tons of cool record stores um, that dealt with like those kind of subcultural type of music. And so... I suppose being on the West Coast as well, that, that, with that time, that sort of yeah. migrate, almost that LA to sort of Seattle kind of migration of sound, you're, you're right in the thick of it there. Yeah, right? and then like, you had bands like... Red Hot Chili Peppers yeah. and Jane's Addiction, and really the first alternative yeah. kind of bands that were doing like kind of combining like this harder stuff with, you know, kind of almost like British influence. Like, you know, basically you know, a band like Jane's Addiction was Joy Division meets heavy metal, <laughs> you know, because Eric Avery played those lines like kind of Peter Hook, you know, and then Dave Navarrosi was like yeah. more of a rocker and it kind of, and then Perry was just like this weird LA freak, you know, which, um, so I, I think it's just kind of like my context of, of being around that stuff. And, 
Yeah, so, yeah, it's funny because it, when I started high school in 1980, I, I distinctly remember the very first day, like, walking in there, you know, walking on campus, and I was like, oh, my God, I'd never seen so many Guns and Roses. It was, like, totally... <laughs> it would have been, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah just it, Guns and that, Roses that everywhere. Yeah, sweet child of mine had yeah. exploded that yeah. summer, and... and and I learned a lot of guitar from that record. I think right. I learned almost that whole record note for note because what a great, I mean, what a great album to learn it's it's rock amazing. guitar from. Yeah. And but then by the time I graduated in '92, it's everything had completely changed. It was anti anti yeah. virtuoso, really, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, by mm -hmm. that time, and is that is that where you think you're? Because that would have been terribly important time in terms of just being influenced, wouldn't it? Just, you know, at that age, just, you know, it's... Well, that was what was so what drew me to bands, like even like the Smashing Pumpkins, because mm. Billy could really play and like mm. there were solos and you're like, okay, that's cool. Like, because I can kind of play like that too, yeah. you know, and I understood like, and I, you know, started listening to whatever alternative bands and The Cure. And so I understood like, wow, that's kind of that with mm -hmm. this and no one's really done much of that. And, or I like bands like Dinosaur Jr. or whatever. And, you know, cause Jay would always yeah. play really cool solos as well. And um, yeah. I don't, think, I don't think that band, that, I don't think the Dinosaur Jr. ever really took off over here, at least not at that time. I don't, yeah. I don't remember them, you know, cause it's, 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 I love, talking to you about music because of course we did grow up yeah all it's and certainly i don't recall dinosaur jr ever uh having the kind of profile over i'd never heard of them i don't think until maybe they were very fringe even ago. in the u.s right. though too i mean i think you know you know they after nirvana and actually dinosaur jr got signed to a major label before nirvana right they were one of the very first you know those kind of bands yeah. but post -nir six nirvana success I think Warner Brothers did try to push them, but it just didn't. It, you know, I mean, that music really wasn't mainstream. No. And as much as they tried to push it that way, it really wasn't. Yeah. And, um, but I think, you know, I was really drawn to these kind of guitar bands that pushed the sonics of what was mm. going on, you know, that, where that was like a, that was a, that was just as much of a way to explore the instrument as mm. technique. Had you already decided by at this point that that was going to be a career path for you, or was that you know later? Um, at that point, I definitely would have. I, I was thinking like, okay, I just want to focus on mm -hmm. music and be a musician. And you know, I tried really hard and got really close many times. You know, to where I thought, okay, it's going to happen. This is it. Or a band I was in was, you know, all getting the, going to get the record deal, and then yeah. it would fall through. And you know, and so by the time I was like late, early thirties, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to, you know, this not really working out, and we have to do something different. And it's a long story how I ended up getting there, but you know, I'd kind of gone back to college, and and so by the time I was in my early thirties, I was I was in a getting a doctorate in literature. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So, yeah. did, so Lassie Foundation then was only ever just like a, never supported you financially then? That was just like a, uh, a side project sort of thing? Or, maybe for bits and periods, right. but not, yeah, not something okay. that, yeah, yeah. We had, we had, we made some money here and there, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. But I, at some point I said, okay, I'm going to kind of give up mm -hmm. music as a, like as trying to survive this way and I was going into academia and yeah, gonna become a professor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good career. It's a good career, but there's probably a lot of mums and dads out there hoping that their children go down that one as opposed yeah. to trying to be a rock star. And so <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is so when I had basically, okay, like I'm going down this other road one day and that's one of the benefits of living in LA is a friend of mine, a former bandmate who kind of was very early online mm -hmm. type. He was like the very first person who told me, they're just saying America online. You know, he's yeah. the first person I ever remember had, like can dial up and get on this thing called the internet, you know. He got, he said, hey, I was talking to somebody on Instant Messenger. Yeah. You know, and Smashing Pumpkins. MySpace. Yeah, they're <laughs> looking for a guitar. They're in LA, then they're reforming, but James isn't coming back and they're looking to be looking for a guitar player. And he's like, I think that you should really you know, try to do this. 
And I'd never in my life audition. I wasn't, you know, in LA, you could definitely try to be a session mm -hmm. musician and audition for bands. I'd never auditioned for a band in my life. It's just not what I was into. And I'd always started my own bands mm -hmm. and were in so. But I was a big fan. And so I said, hey, what the heck? You know, and. Yeah. And here we get one 12, chance. 12 years later, here I am <laughs> talking to you. Well, so what was that? Um, I'd not realized, I, I said, I think I'd, I'd maybe assumed that the Lassie Foundation had maybe perhaps been a bit bigger than, than maybe they were. So I kind of assumed almost that you'd been headhunted to go and join no, Pumpkins. No, no, no. But, uh, but I think that, I think the more I think about it, you know, um, to really play... No one to play the pumpkin style, mm -hmm. but then also be able to add your own thing to it is that you would have had to have come up only at that time where you understood that kind of that confluence of heavy metal, yeah. you know, early 80s post punk guitar that kind of came from the UK and be fluent in both languages mm. entirely. You know, because I think you'd find a lot of guitar players that can play like Will Sargent from Echo and the Bunnymen or whatever, but they can't play like Tony Iommi yeah and then you find a lot of metal guys but if they have to play something clean pretty and beautiful and to play in pumpkins you got to be able to do both you know and and on top of that like acoustic foot because yeah. you know acoustic folk things and you know because the you know the breadth of the band is very wide and kind of sonically yeah. and so I think it was you know someone that's kind of my age demographic and stuff that would have kind of understood those musics and especially from a guitar playing perspective, you know, so not that I was headhunted, but I think when they looked at my bio mm -hmm. and, you know, I knew enough about the band to, to put the right names and the right influences on yeah. there to where I was going to shoot how to you, the top of the line faster than anybody else. How do you mm -hmm. um, approach uh, a situation where you've got a, 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 you know, a really, or how did you approach, rather, right? you know, this idea you've got this very high profile band already, one of the founder members decides they don't want to be it anymore yeah. and they're kind of going, well, you're going to fill this dude's yeah. shoes. Um, do you, do you, are you very careful to sort of respect the um, songs the way they have been written before? Or, or actually, do you think the opposite? Do you think it's important to go in and kind of go, look, here's kind of my flavor of it? I, or, you know, or do you have to like kind of get in there first before you mm. can put your flavor in? It's something that's kind of evolved over the times and there's certain approaches the band has had that, that vary from time to time. I mean, there have been periods of the band where almost every version of every song was some type of reinterpretation mm -hmm. where we didn't play things too much like the record. And where nowadays, because of the way the music industry's changed and the types of tours that we're doing that, and now that we have three guitar players with me, you know, Billy and James, that we're actually able to replicate more of the sounds that are on the record. Um, so I think that, you know, nowadays we're more into like, well, when we're playing the classic, we just present it as the classic for yeah. the most part, you know, you know, for the most part. And so in that, you have to find the space where like, okay, how it's like an interpretive thing. How am I going to interpret, you know, these parts that are already there? Or you find little pockets where you're injecting your own personality. And I think that, you know, um, as, as time has progressed and I've, you know, I feel more comfortable in my role in the band that I'm able to play more like me in a way, even if I'm playing an older song, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a certain approach to the, to the song that you yeah. kind of inject in into it. and that was like you know it's again like seeing Reeves the other night playing with the cure you know most of the time he's having to play the parts on the record but he plays them in the way that he yeah. only he would play them and so I think you get more into that type of yeah that type of thinking with it uh, and just generally I mean you were you starstruck for like the first six months of being in the Smashing Pumpkins or, or are, you, is it that, um, are you not that kind of guy are you kind of cool and it's just hey I wasn't like... Billy Corgan. Well, no, because, you know, the thing <laughs> is, is, you know, it wasn't like an audition where I went, yeah. I played three songs, I said, okay, we'll call you on Tuesday yeah. and let you know. It was a thing because they were in L.A. and I lived in L.A. They would be like, hey, let's get together, let's play a couple songs. And then they would invite, they'd say, hey, come hang out at the studio with us. So I got to hang out with them over yeah. like a three or four month period wow, of right. time and get to know them and... And so it wasn't as like when we started playing, it wasn't like, oh, okay, like I've never... But, oh my God, it was... Still must have been massive gigs compared to what you'd been Oh, on. no, no, no. I was, honestly, like, it was, it was 
hard. It was like the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. Like right. I really, at some points, didn't didn't know if I could do it. I mean, because I was in an indie band. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. we had you know, if we made money, it was very little. Like I said, you know, it wasn't like I was you know, <laughs> I had like two guitars. I sh- you know, I had two guitars. You know what I mean? Like two guitars, a couple pedals. You know what this I mean? This is brilliant. Some shitty amp. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so then you know, I walk in the first rehearsal. There's like literally two diesel Herbert heads. Yeah. Two Wagner, Uber shawls, like five Les Pauls. I've never even played a Les. I, I, I mean, I played one. I never played one. Like in yeah. a, you know. So you're stuck having to learn fifty songs, playing guitars you've never used, playing through amps you've never played for. It was insane, and but kind we, of awesome. We, we were laughing about it because you know we just played in this run. We played Rock and Ring and Rock and Park mm-hmm. in Germany, which are like massive. You know, like sixty thousand yeah. people and. That was like my third show with the band was <laughs> Rock and Rig. And I don't even, I barely remember it because I was just so yeah. scared and like not used to playing in that kind of space, you know, with the sound and negotiating all that stuff and the material, you know, I was just frightened and just trying to make it through. And so to come back, you know, 12 years later and just, thoroughly be able to enjoy the experience yeah as a, i mean i it was crazy no I, it, I, believe me it was it was crazy i can i, yeah, really, I can only imagine you know i didn't what, know you know i played in clubs you know like exactly like, yeah before yeah which and that's that in a way i kind yeah. of think you know it's almost like there's hope for us all yet one day you know you like your know. favorite band will go hey do you want to come and talk you, so. you never know but you, you never, never know, know. now i i watched you um giving a, a sort of a rig rundown um, of your live rig, uh-huh. um, and it's a you know two racks of <laughs> yeah. um, valve preamps and valve power amps and yeah. and uh, tons of pedals that you slide out on drawers <laughs> and a helix on the floor and everything like that, which is which I kind of expected it would be. You know, I can't. Yeah. You know, that is the sound, isn't it? You know, it's these very layered sounds. Yeah. Um, but were you? You know, how many years did it kind of take you to? Um, you, know, you talked about you know you had two guitars and two pedals. You yeah, know, I'm sure you probably had one or two more than that. But you know what? What? How? How do you kind of? Is that just a learning experience? As you kind of just you 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 know you oh, I'll try this, I'll try this, and then you gradually put these rigs together. Or? Well, I was I did have a lot of pedals back then. You know what I mean? But um, with the pumpkins, it was you know it's a it was a different approach than complete. Lassie was much like I'd use a clean amp mm-hmm. and use pedals for everything, mm-hmm. which is kind of what's you know what people are doing nowadays very yeah. popular kind of paradigm for mm-hmm. guitar where pumpkins it was like no most of 90 percent of the distortion is going to come from the head right you know from mm-hmm. like this kind of very saturated high gain modern preamp mm-hmm. distortion and so that that in and of itself you have to you know you have to start thinking so yeah i went through many iterations of putting rigs together and trying to figure out what would work best for me to be able to have kind of the flexibility that I wanted, you know, integrity of signal to because if you're running a bunch of pedals before a high gain amp, yeah. you're going to lose a lot of the juice going into the head, which is like, which, yeah. is, which you don't want. And then, but then be able to have the flexibility of getting all these different sonics and textures, um, you know, and so in the early, you know, mid 2000s, you know, it was like you could get you know, we were using like kind of these MIDI switching mm. systems where you'd have the pedals in a rack yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. But then it was still very limited because you had to make choices about, well, that pedal is going to go in this order. And it was just kind of a linear thing. Like you have eight pedals before the amp, maybe eight pedals or rack units post, but you couldn't really, you know, there was, there was only like one unit that I can't remember what it was called that allowed you to kind of change the order mm-hmm. of the loops, you know. But um, but nowadays, because of things like Helix or, you know, Fractal, whatever, you can use, you know, you can, um, you know, you can use what they, whatever they call four cable methods. Yeah. So where you're kind of basically going into your digital unit, you know, running your preamp section of your head through one of the loops of that and mm-hmm. then going back in and then into your power section of your head or power amp like we so but what's great about something like helix is then that kind of signal routing is virtual yeah. and so you can change it literally preset to preset which now i have the ultimate flexibility of like i want to have this drive pedal before the head you know but i want this yeah. big stereo delay and reverb post which you know and you can change that literally from song to song so that now I think it's kind of kept, 
technology is caught up in a way yeah. to where I don't see having to rebuild rigs over and over again anymore because you know you have you know you have the flexibility within the unit you, itself. You've not you've not made the full jump to just having helix yet, have you, or, or whatever the? Honestly, I, I I think I could. You think you could now? Yeah. You know, I think I could. Um, I bet your tour but, manager would love you if you did that, wouldn't you? Product, yeah, it'd save a lot of money, for sure. And then you can, well, because then it's like you can fly anywhere in the world and you yeah. have your rig with you. You know, I can show up with the, I could come here and be like, yeah, you know, put my laptop and have my sounds. Um, it, 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 there still is, you know, there still are differences, yeah. like the way certain things react in an amp and we have the luxury that we could, can carry all this stuff around yeah. and... And Billy's, you know, probably the biggest. Like he just doesn't want to make that that switch. And 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 I totally get it. You know, I totally get it. And so it is, it is fun, being able to use like you know, oh. like the big amps and. and I, I mean, of, I, I'm, yeah. I, yeah, I'm. But still, it's strange because we know we're on in ears, right? So it's not like you get to hear it in that way. It's like you. So to me, that's why I mean, going fully digital, really, it wouldn't be that shocking because it would sound almost the same yeah close yeah. enough yeah yeah, um, yeah 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 i mean it's 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 interesting we were talking a little bit about billy before you started so to, is he's a real like tone geek right yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah in the nicest possible way you know as no, in, like, we all, i mean we all are to a certain yeah. degree yeah 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 but, but. i mean i i mentioned <laughs> um uh that i, I billy had low there was a you know went around facebook for about a week about six months ago that Billy had been quoted, you know, completely seriously and deadpan in an article that he was absolutely convinced he could physically hear the different tonality of colours of guitars. Um, and, and and I kind yeah. of, I was like, so come on, was that just a joke? And do you tell no, me what no, you... No, and I said, know. no, I think it's true because we've sat there and we've talked about it. Like, oh, the white ones sound better than the black ones or whatever. And, and, and I, you know, and I said, but basically that I agree because... And I don't know this, you know, I don't know the science of it, you know, or the chemistry of yeah. it, but that, you know, there's certain probably properties in certain types of paint, you know, and, and like I said, and also to get the paint to look a certain way, they may have to put more layers on it or use a different type of primer over the color to get it to look a certain way that I would, I wouldn't be surprised if those things do affect the actual So stuff. there you go, internet. That's yeah. your next twelve know, months worth know, of arguing know, sorted know, for like, you. <laughs> you know, color depends. Makes well, a depends. You know, it depend, <laughs> depends what aliens paint. Them. <laughs> right, it it's what, awesome. What it's awesome. Well, well. It, we should now yeah. wheel in our little kind of um, our little board, our little special kind of. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be like a. <clears throat> it's like a lassie board or a, or a pumpkins board or or just a Schroeder board. I mean, it's just like a. It's a who knows. We, we, I, the, the way this went was uh, Jeff was driving down this morning and I was kind of like, I've got this idea for a, a video. <laughs> Are you cool if we just kind of like grab some pedals and talk about putting together a little shoegazer board? It's like, yeah, we're cool. So we're, yeah. almost no research has gone into this at all. <laughs> it's no. just, it's a random selection of pedals that Jeff's used in the past. And yeah, let's check it out.
cool, man. It's um, <laughs> so let's welcome back to part two. Yeah. Um, and I kind of we, we, okay. Jeff picked these pedals out. In fact, you you can tell us the sort of the whys and stuff, but we really just let Jeff just kind of yeah. have a fiddle around and just noodle and see where it, some of the. I really felt when you were playing those octave mm -hmm. parts, you were really kind of going, "Oh, I, I found something here," you know? Yeah, it's like, yeah. And I guess that's the whole joy of this kind of soundscaping like this. Isn't yeah, it? it's just being able to you know react to what you know. Well, you want you want the pedals to do things that you're expecting them to do, but also you're looking for the surprises of like what it you know what it gives you back and i think that's what makes especially if you're playing things like that that's the kind of stuff that you're looking for to kind of have that that engagement as a player to be able to react to the sound and the environment that you're creating so um, take us through you you you're, you pretty <coughs> much chose these pedals i know we said you've got to try this you've not tried that and it's before. awesome this is yeah. so cool like I'll, no, well, I'll, I know. I'll be your extra foot as well because half the fun with yeah, this is, yeah, is yeah. literally doing the, yeah. the sort of if you get the yeah Where should we start? Should we start this end or this end? Uh, Half of me thinks we should start this end just because it's kind of like, isn't this where every 13 year old wannabe guitar player starts? And true. <laughs> I would say, you know, like, you know, interesting for me, because I grew up, my very first, I started with rack effects. Right. Because I, you know, I, I did detect oh, GSP, I did detect GSP. GSP 5. Yes. I still have it. I have everything still, and I still have it, and so, like, so I always kind of had... Do you, do you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I was just like... Because I, I would have been selling stuff from probably 1990 onwards, roughly. And so I remember telling people, like, the Zoom yeah. 9002 was the best thing you'd ever heard. And then the GSP-5. And then <laughs> what was the what was the Roland had a... GP-8. GP-8 was and the best GP thing you'd ever heard. And then all the ART stuff yeah. was the best thing you ever heard. And honestly, it comes back through the store 10 or 15 years later as like a used part exchange. And you're just like, oh man, it's the worst thing <laughs> yeah, I've ever heard in my life. And you're like, but I told that for, I, I guess know. I got to take it because I told them to buy it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, so I was always kind of used to being able to have distortion, delay, reverb all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, uh, but the reason I picked the rat is because... Um, I think especially for creating these types of tones, you know, sometimes fuzz is good, but sometimes you need something with a little more clarity. And the reason, I feel like the Rat is like a pedal that's kind of in between an overdrive distortion mm -hmm. and a fuzz. Because mm -hmm. it kind of has, you can get fuzz-like, but it still cuts mm -hmm. through. Because anybody who knows who tries to use fuzz live, it's always, especially if you're playing with a more robust rock band, sometimes it's really hard to get the fuzz to cut through the mix. Like it sounds great when you're playing by yourself, but when the whole band comes in, it's always like, where'd the guitar go? Yeah. And so the Rat is a good, you know, you know, a good pedal. And, you know, honestly, and then playing it, like, I mean, I barely touch the knobs, you know what I mean? Because I kind of can eyeball because I've used them for so many years. And it just, you know, with the Strat, you know what I mean? Never played this guitar, never played this amp, didn't even yeah. touch the settings, and pretty instantly able to get it to sound really good. I thought so. As yeah. soon as that kicked in, for me, it had a sounds sound. Sounds big, and it sounds sounded big, big, and yeah. it sounds warm but not too thin, you know, yeah. not too heavy metal, yeah, you know? But, but heavy and fat, but, but yeah. like you say, not necessarily in a metal no. kind of context. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. we are, just so you guys know, we've, we've got two completely clean amps in stereo. One is the, the Fender Bass Breaker 30, the other is the yeah. Victory, uh, the, the Duchess. Uh, but yeah, all flat, all clean, no reverb, mm. Everything's yeah. here, and the stereo out comes at the end of the uh, memory man. So one of the amps is doing the SLO, and the other one is yeah. uh, it just uh, has no reverb on it. It's anyway, sorry. So that's yeah. the rat. It's so the rat, and then I like you know the Pog is such a great you know easy pedal to use for doing octave up, octave down, yeah. and and you know I use that a lot actually, and especially if I'm playing like kind of single note clean stuff. I like to have, like I'll, you know, I'll do whatever, I have something like this and then, you know. You know what I mean? It just kind of makes lines pop out a little bit more. I dialed your yeah. mix up a bit <laughs> yeah, yeah, before yeah. there, didn't I? You know what I mean? But <laughs> it's just like a good, you it's know. Great. Um, you can get more kind of exotic sounding kind of thing yeah. like that. So that's always. Do you, do you always tend to use octave up and octave down or do you use it more of a sub octave? Or? Sometimes both. 
I mean, it's a diff, diff, you know, usually I'm using a virtual one, mm-hmm. you know, so from, you know, in, in a digital, like something like Helix or something. Mm-hmm. So I use sometimes a combination of both or one or the other, or it just depends. Yeah. yeah so I, anywhere in between. And, and actually I do a lot of stuff um, with full actually harmonization mm-hmm. too, where it's certain pitches like a fourth up and a sixth right. down in a certain key. You what, what are, you, are you using Helix for that? Or are you Helix, using like yeah. a whammy? Just no, Helix, Helix right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, bet you, I bet whammies have been on your boards though, haven't they? I used, well, I had them in my rack, yeah, right. and would use a MIDI, but now in, in Helix, the pitch like has whammy type of, and it's, yeah, it's great, you know, so. And then I, I'm a chorus freak. I know it's it's like, I like, you know, some people hate chorus. Some people love it. You know, it seems like it's kind of coming back. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, because, you know, especially like in more pop-related music, everybody's pulling from these sounds from all yeah. different eras. And so you hear like guitar playing like clean, mm-hmm. that clean 80s rolling jazz chorus. Yeah. But I've always loved because I'm a huge fan of like the Cocteau Twins and cool. that type of yeah kind of guitar but so i always i love chorus and i've always used a chorus pedal um what's the chorus pedal that you use if you're not using the one in the helix or do you always use a standalone i you know i one of my favorite ones is the um analog man right um his Are you're shopping pedal? with you're shopping at the high to low end of the uh <laughs> but <is what> you... <laughs> honestly this is i use this emulation in helix right probably the most yeah. Is what I use almost all the time. Yeah. Now. So actually this and I just haven't had a chance to pick one of these up, but I would probably buy it. Yeah, this C C E two is my favorite old yeah. boss chorus and then I, we we just use the Wazza version which has got the stereo out, yeah. which the original one doesn't have. But it's a killer sounding yeah. big chorus, isn't it? So Yeah. And, and then I, yeah. I love the memory man. Um and I use I have a couple vintage ones, I have the newer ones. Um, and I like this one because it has the reverse echo. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's for kind of like buddy and shoegazers, if they want to do the kind of the, the My Bloody Valentine thing, you know, you kind of have to have that like this. You probably do something more like, let me see. Because I, I don't think I've ever really used reverse echo. I find that quite difficult, but no, I love what the, how yeah, the parts see. were coming together. Yeah. Oh, it's all just the reverse. Uh, yeah. Right. And, okay. You know, and ideally, yeah, and ideally, I might run this in front of the distortion in like a studio to have this go into the distortion. But this is, you know, I mean, but. but I mean that's kind of a cla- <laughs> that's a classic shoegaze you know move with that that you know Kevin Shields you know I think he used a reverse reverb on the SPX ninety right. but it's just kind of that reversing the sound into maybe, maybe that's you mu- don't you find that terribly difficult to even know where you are because the notes you know like one second behind yeah but I think a lot of times you know you're you're playing over some type of hypnotic right. groove and you're right. just going to be playing. tap tempo it and get it in time you know what i mean it's so wicked. yeah yeah but it's it's all you know but and, and with this yeah with i feel i feel fun. like i've i can't remember what what was the um which was the the setting that we had the other day pete that was there was one on here that was just like insane i don't know if we were on the if we're on the right one or not but super cool stuff so this is i think between this and you know a guitar like a strat we can get a lot of a lot of a lot of sounds from that you know with this kind of rig and i mean you can shoegaze all day long because i mean because something (laughs) like this is like the the you know this delay has so many different settings i would just you know we're just using just the one but you know it's got tons of cool stuff in there Oh, well, yeah. there we are. There is your uh, lesson 101 <laughs> in uh, how to get shoegazing. So you need a distortion pedal, a pog, a chorus, a crazy delay, and a massive reverb. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, 
one of the hugest things in all this, and then this is no place to get into this debate though, is order. No, you, well, it, you, can, you can have like a 30 second, you know, so why? Yeah, so like, because a lot of times what I would do, especially in like Lassie type of stuff, is I was running delays into distortion. So oftentimes I'd have two distortion pedals in the signal chain, one at the beginning, one at the end, and I'd have like a wah pedal between them too. So you could get these really kind of fuzzed out yeah. wah type of thing. So I think that's that's a really important part because like certain other bands like Swerve Driver and stuff had this more aggressive type mm. of thing. And you definitely have to run delays and reverbs into distortion, and right. which is technically the wrong, the, yeah, the is, wrong is, way so to do it. So that's a shoegazer thing, is it? Whatever the rule book says, do it differently and well, then see you what You know, happens. but it just depends, though. But like certain, <laughs> you know, bands like whatever, um, like something like, like more like an earlier band, like the Cocteau Twins, is more like, I guess people wouldn't necessarily call them shoegazers, maybe like Dream Pop or mm -hmm. whatever <laughs> name they'd have for it. But, you know, we're... Definitely, you can't. You wouldn't want to do those types of things to get those types of tones. So, um, I think that's why you got to have at least two two rats. I always had two. Okay. A regular. And what, a do you, turbo. what do you call like a? What do you call like a? Um, like a? It's not a herd of rats, is it? What do you call it? <laughs> pack. A pack. A pack of rats. <laughs> that's pack what it rats. is. Is it? Um, well, look, man. It was super, super kind of you to come down yeah, today. Yeah, thank you for having um, me. I loved I, it. I, you know, I hope the all the dates and stuff, and you were saying about you know plans for, uh, yeah, for yeah. pumpkins in the future. I hope that you know I hope that all works out really brilliantly for you. Uh, and there you go. Uh, you know, go check out Jeff. Um, I'm sure on your own social stuff. You know, you've probably got yeah. loads of posts about pedals and pedals stuff that you're and, trying. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, cool, man. But thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for watching. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Awesome.